Good afternoon. I trust you have had a great Lord's Day. I trust that you have been able already to worship the Lord together as a family, um, praying together, listening to the Word of God together. I pray that you've just had a tremendous day. It is rather surreal for me and, and quite honestly heartbreaking to be in this building right now getting ready to preach a message with virtually no one in the building save a couple of sound men that are no fun to preach to, okay? And uh, so it is rather different. It's very heartbreaking, um, and it's very hard for me to preach to a telephone. Uh, But I know that through that, the Lord is able to use it to prayerfully be a blessing to you. I'm thankful that we have that technology uh, there are many churches that do not have that technology, and, and they have really uh, no way of communication with their pastor, and, uh, and that's heartbreaking. So I'm thankful that at least we have this semblance of meeting together around God's Word, uh, and I would ask you to please uh, like uh, this video. Um, if you would, comment, uh, share it. Um, for others in our church to that they'll be um, able to see it. I encourage you to let me know how uh, this is helping you and benefiting you so that I know uh, that I'm just not up here uh, wasting my time, uh, for lack of a better words. Uh, I, I know, I want to know and hear from you how the Lord is helping you through these um, Facebook Live and YouTube messages. I want to preach to you this evening on this thought, help is on the way. Help is on the way. And our text is going to be taken from Psalm 121, Psalm uh, number 121. And it starts off in verse number one. The psalmist says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Let's quickly pray together. Our Father, we ask you, Lord, to bless this time of preaching. We pray that you'd use this word I pray that it would be a help to those who hear it. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. One of the most powerful words, one of the most poignant words in all of the English language is the word help. Uh, It is the cry of help that maybe a small child will use if he if he has fallen down and has hurt himself he may cry out to his mom or his dad help it is the cry of maybe a young mother or even a father who has just recently found themselves not only to be working their own jobs but now have taken on the responsibility of teaching their school-aged children and maybe becoming their cafeteria workers because all those children have to eat throughout the day, right? And maybe a young mother or young father is crying out right now, help. The word help is also the cry of a man who is sitting at his table and he's surrounded by a stack of unpaid bills. Maybe he has children in his home who are hungry He has in his account a zero balance and he has no job. 
Well, certainly all of us, at least at one time or another, have cried out for help. All of us have at one time or another. But I wondered this evening, have you ever been in a position where the only one who could give you any help was the Lord? I wonder that this evening. Well, this was the exact position that the psalmist found himself in. He was in a situation where the only place he could turn, the only person to whom he could turn to was the Lord. Psalm 121 is a great chapter. It is a tremendous chapter, especially as we deal with the things that we're dealing with today. Not only the the crisis in your own home, but even today, even a global crisis. So it's a great chapter. This is a chapter in the book of Psalms that is called the Traveler's Psalms, or the Song of Ascent. Psalms 120 through Psalm 134 are all Psalms of Ascent. That is, that the Jews, the pilgrims, the Israelites, as they made their way to Jerusalem, no matter which way they came in, came in, if they came in from the north, the south, the east, or the west, they had to make their way to Jerusalem. And as they did, they ascended slowly because Jerusalem sits on a hill. It sits about 2,500 feet above sea level. So these were songs that the pilgrims would sing as they traveled to Jerusalem And they would have to travel to Jerusalem at least a couple to three times a year for the various feasts and so forth. Maybe the Feast of Passover, the Feast of Pentecost, and so on. And so these are called the Songs of Ascent, the the Traveler's Psalms. Well, these travelers, these pilgrims, could, along the way, as they're traveling to Jerusalem, face many obstacles along their path. Now understand, when they traveled in these days, these are uh, obviously ancient days, these were rocky paths, and so that they were uh, prone to maybe slip and fall. Uh, They did not have Highway 64 to travel on, right? So they did everything by foot. They walked, and these paths were very rough in spots. They also had to deal with, with uh, rough weather. Uh, they were, um, you know, had to deal with the uh, elements, the, the rain and the storms and whatever came about on their journey. And they, and they also had to deal with robbers and thieves, those who would be hiding out and waiting to ambush maybe a family. Uh, Many times that's why they traveled in caravans, but sometimes that was not available. And these thieves and robbers would uh, present danger to them. Well, their journeys, as I think about this, their journeys are a lot like our own lives, our own journeys, because we too are pilgrims who are traveling through this world. And in this world, as we travel, we have in our lives many times storms and obstacles that we have to deal with. And so I'm just going to do a very quick study on this particular psalm. The first thing I want you to notice with me this evening is this. We learn through this psalm that the Lord is our provider. He is our provider. The psalmist starts out, he says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. Where comes my help? He's asking a question, from where does my help come from? And it's almost the the psalmist is like an unbeliever here. And then we see as the following verses unfold, he gives us the answer to his question. And so as the traveler approached Jerusalem, he would would be faced with mountains on every side. Jerusalem, as I said earlier, was surrounded by hills. It sat 
on a uh, sea level that was about 2,500 feet above sea level. And it is here we find the thoughts of the psalmist are, are really uh, are upon the Lord. He, he seems to be asking a question, I will lift up my eyes to the hills, from where does my help come from? But what he finds out and what he tells us in the preceding verses, or in the following verses, is that it was not the hills he was to be focusing on. He was focusing on the one who sits above the hills, the Lord. He was looking really beyond the mountains. He was looking to the one who formed and made the mountains. He asked himself, where does my help come from? Listen, this is the question many are no doubt asking today. From your house to the White House. They're asking, where does my help come from? Where do I look for refuge? Where do I look for help and hope? Maybe that's a question you're asking in your own home. You're dealing with your own crisis in your own home. Churches are no doubt asking this question. Governments, city, state, nation, national governments, nations as a whole right now are asking, where does my help come from? Well, as we see, our help is not going to be found. It is never going to be found in the hills of humanistic living. Our help, the help that we need, is never going to be found in the hills of humanistic living. Nor is our help going to be found in the halls of higher learning. Education in, in and of itself is not going to help the situation. Listen, our help can only be found in the heaven of our holy Lord. I love what Jeremiah says in Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 23. He says, truly, in vain is salvation, hoped for from the hills. And then he goes on to say, truly in the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. Hey, listen, we are all going to be shaken at some point or another. We're all going to be shaken by the tremors of our trials, by the tremors of our tribulations. But it is when we feel the ground literally shaken beneath our feet, as we find in this psalm, God gives us, He gives His children three very important things as we face these difficult days. The first thing he gives us is security. He gives us security. There are many today that long for this thing of security. Verse 2. Now remember, he asked the question in verse 1, where does my help come from? He answers that question in verse 2. He says, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Now, can you think of anyone you would rather have as your helper than the God who created this universe? I cannot. He is the logical answer. He is our help. Listen, I'm talking about the God who is higher than the hills. I'm talking about our God who is mightier than the highest mountains. I'm talking about the one who created this world with just his word. I'm talking about the one who created this world, who created and formed the mountains and scooped out the seas with just the work of his hands. I love how Jeremiah chapter 32 and verse 17 When he thinks about the majesty of our God, he thinks about the omnipotence of our God, he 
cries out, Oh, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. And then he gives a statement that I love, and I pray you, you get this. He says, there is nothing too hard for you. There's nothing too hard for you, God. Hey, listen, do you realize that God is your help in time of trouble? Do you realize that our God is, He gives us security, He gives us hope and help in times of tribulation? Oh, would to God that you listening would turn to Him this afternoon, this evening, and as your only hope. Oh, would to God, our nation, who has absolutely lost its moral compass over the last 50 to 75 years. Oh, would to God that our nation would fall on her knees and cry out to the only one who can help us during this time, and that is our God, the God of Israel. He gives us security. Our security does not come from the government, although we are thankful for our good government. Our security never comes from education, though we are thankful for great education. Our security only comes from the Lord. But then He gives us something else. Not only does He give us security, but He gives us stability. He gives us stability. We need this today. You need this today. He says in verse 3 that he will not allow your foot to be moved. He will not allow your foot to be moved. The word moved there means to slip or to slide. It means to stagger or to be shaken. Again, while traveling, these pilgrims, as they're traveling to Jerusalem, it was not an easy task. It was not like they were walking on pavement. No, they were walking on a very rough path that was very rocky, that was easily for them to slip or to twist an ankle. Hey, listen. How many of you today that are living below in this old sinful world understand that our travels are not easy? Our travels are not easy. And how many of you tonight know that if it was not for the Lord, if it was not for our God, our faith would slip. Our faith in Him would slip. But listen, He gives us stability. Not necessarily physical stability, but we're talking here about our soul. We're talking about our spirit. He gives us spiritual stability. So notice, thirdly, not only does our Lord give us security and stability, but He gives us also serenity. Serenity. He gives us His peace. I love verse 3. He says, He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber, slumber nor sleep. Now the word slumber there speaks of that person who is drowsy, that person who keeps nodding off. You know, maybe like what you're doing right now, listening to me preach or something, but, <laughs> but it speaks of that person who's really not engaged. You're kind of just drowsy, nodding off, not paying attention. And of course, the word sleep means that he is absolutely, totally disengaged. He's out. But it tells us, our verse tells us, he who keeps you will not slumber. He will not sleep. Now think about the peace that that gives us. As we think about that even the most loving parents in this world, even the most responsible loving parents in this world cannot watch their children 24 hours a day and seven days a week. But God can, and He does. Hey, listen, that gives us peace. 
That gives us serenity. How blessed we are this evening to realize the truth that the God who made this universe, He never slumbers nor He sleeps. He sustains us. And guess what? He knows you by name. He knows you by name. As a matter of fact, the Scripture tells us in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said that even the number of our hairs are numbered. Amazing. You say, Brother Wade, why, why is that significant? Why, what does that matter that the Lord knows the numbers of our hair? Well, it means that if the Lord knows all of that, if He knows those insignificant things of our life, that means that He knows very well the much bigger issues that you face in this life. That's what he's saying. We serve the God who knows the number of hairs upon your head. He is so intricately involved in your life that he knows those seemingly insignificant things. If he knows those things, how much more does he know those bigger, significant things that you're dealing with? And guess what? He never sleeps. He never slumbers. God is on watch 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days out of the year. Hey, listen. The reason tonight why you should rest The reason tonight why you should get a good night's sleep is because we know that God does not sleep. That's what gives us peace. Knowing that when we have to be resting and sleeping and not engaged in our life because of the sleep, our God never sleeps. He's always engaged in our heart and our life. Now think about this. When David was pursued by his own son, remember his own son Absalom rebelled against him. I mean, there was in, a, in, in a, almost a literal way a wanted poster, wanted dead or alive for David. Absalom wanted his own father killed. David had to run for his life in the hills. He had to run and hide in the caves. But yet, David writes in Psalm 4 in verse 8. He says, I will both lie down in peace and sleep. And he says, for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Hey, listen, the Lord is always there when you need Him. And that gives us security, stability, and serenity. It gives us peace that passes all understanding, even in a time of crisis. The second thing we learn in this psalm is that the Lord is not only our provider, He is our protector. He is our protector. Verse 5. I love this. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. It's very interesting how many times we find this word keep or protect or preserve in this particular psalm. Rather short psalm, but we see this found, these words found six different times. That word keep. It means to guard. It means to protect. And what we find here is that it is the Lord and the Lord alone, the omnipotent one, the self-existing God. He is the keeper. He is the preserver of His people. The people of God are kept at all times. In all circumstances, by His mighty power unto eternal salvation. Praise the Lord. 
Hey, listen, when it speaks of God as our protector, when it speaks of God as our keeper, and really this is seen in the, in the different titles which implies of his protection, such as he is called our shepherd, right? God is our, our shepherd. What is a shepherd? He is one who keeps the flock. He's the one that feeds and protects his sheep. And then God is likened unto the king. He is the king. What does a king do? A king protects all of those and keeps all of those that are in his kingdom. And then the Lord Jesus is likened unto a husband. What does a husband do? A husband protects and keeps his wife. He loves his wife. And then finally, he is likened unto God, is likened unto our Father our Heavenly Father who loves and keeps His own children. So even the different titles of our Lord uh, display for us the truth that the Lord is our protector. He is our keeper. And we notice it says the Lord is our keeper. Very important there that it does not say that the Lord's angels are our keeper but the Lord Himself. Now, how great it would be if He would just say that the Lord's angels, that the angels in heaven are our keeper. I mean, they're powerful. They're mighty. But it is the Almighty One who is our keeper. And then we see that phrase, the Lord is your shade at your right hand. I won't get into all of what that verse talks about, but this verse primarily speaks of his protection that is much like that we see given by the shade of a tree against the scorching rays of the sun. And if you know, here in Arkansas, it gets very hot in the summertime, and if you're outside working, there's nothing more... Uh, refreshing to you than for you to find some kind of a shade on a hot sunny day, right? And it is in that shade that you find rest. It is in that shade you find refreshment. But also this speaks of, if, if He is our shade, then this speaks of also that He is very near us, right? I mean, how can you be shaded if you are Miles and miles away. So this speaks of his nearness to his children. He is watching over us. He is our shade. He gives us rest and refreshment. And then we see in verse number 6, The sun shall not strike you by day and the moon, nor by the moon by night. And what this means is that no matter what time of the day, day or night, if the land is lit up by the sun or if if it is lit up by the moonlight, the Lord is our keeper. The Lord is our protector. And then we notice, lastly, the third and final thing. We, We not only see that the Lord is our provider, And the Lord is our protector. But what we learn in this particular psalm is that the Lord is our preserver. He is our preserver. Verse 7, and just notice how many times you see this word preserve mentioned. Verse 7 says, The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out And you're coming in from this time forth and even evermore. The word there translated preserve is the same Hebrew word for keep. And this word is a a great alternative uh, because God does more than just protect. He does more than just keep. He also preserves us. And this is seen also in the New Testament. In Jude and verse 1, it says that to those who are called, 
sanctification by God the Father. And then it says, and preserved in Jesus Christ. So we are not only preserved, or excuse me, we're not only protected by the Lord, but we are also preserved by the Lord. Listen, God does not always prevent trouble from coming our way. He does not always uh, keep that from happening. But He does promise to protect and preserve us. Okay? Now, I want to say this, that it is not saying that it is always the Lord's will to protect and preserve our bodies, our fleshly bodies. It doesn't say that. What does it say that He is going to preserve? Well, the text tells us that He is going to preserve, preserve your soul. It is our souls that He will protect. Because, listen, one day the inevitable is going to happen. You're going to get sick and you're going to die. But it is then that the Lord, He preserves the soul and He takes that soul to Him to be with Him in heaven forever. So what does a Christian, what does a believer have to fear? And maybe to, tonight you're, you're, you're listening to this and you're fearful about this virus. What are you afraid of? Are you afraid of death? Listen, Christ has defeated death. What fears, what makes you fear? Hey, listen, for a believer, you should fear nothing. Even death has been swallowed up. He is the preserver of our souls. That when, that, when it's our time to come to Him, listen, yes, our bodies will remain. Our bodies will die, but our soul will live on and on in glory. The Lord is our preserver. And so we see, notice with me in verse 7, the Lord will preserve us spiritually. He will preserve us spiritually. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. And I think Daniel and Joseph are great examples of how the Lord's protection and the Lord preserving of their life. The, the, the two words, all evil, where it says the Lord shall pres preserve you from all evil, it means anything that could harm us, anything that could hurt us, but in His grace, He turns into good the things that we think are evil. For instance, we use Joseph as an example in the book of Genesis. Think about all that he had to slander, all the hatred that, that he had to endure by his own brothers. And because of that, there was a 13-year separation from him and his father. And then as he is in Egypt, we know that he endures the false, false accusations of Potiphar's wife, which, line, which throws him, in essence, in prison for years. All because, not of anything wrong that he did, all because of his brother's sin against him. But in the end, Joseph was able to say to his brothers, he said, you may have meant this evil against me. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for the good. Oh, listen, Paul says the same thing in a nutshell in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. And we know that all things work together for the good. All things work together. The Lord will preserve us spiritually. And then notice quickly, the Lord will preserve us continually. I love this phrase here, and I pray that you get this. In verse 8, it says, The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth. Now, this phrase right here, 
this going out and coming in was a wonderful Old Testament idiom. It was an Old Testament expression that describes the regular, everyday routines of life. And so what this verse is saying is that as you go about your life, even though that you may not be mindful, the Lord is continually preserving you. He is keeping you, protecting you. Even as you go about your everyday routines of life, He's watching you. Even when maybe you're not even watching or taking care of yourself, He is. What a blessing that is. And then finally we see this verse teaches us that the Lord will preserve us eternally. He will preserve us eternally. We've already talked about that, how the Lord has promised to preserve not our bodies, but our souls. And verse 8, it says, The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth. And I love this phrase, and even forevermore. And even forevermore. Listen, this is one of the great one sentence statements on eternal security that is found in all of the Word of God. From the very moment that one is saved, from the very moment one is born into the kingdom of God, throughout time and then throughout eternity, God here promises to preserve and to protect His children. Listen, someone may say, well, Brother Wade, what about those times when I am not faithful to God? And certainly that can be said for all of us at some point in our lives that We've not been as faithful to him as we should. And somebody might be worried and can uh, express fear in thinking, well, what about those times when I'm not faithful to God? Well, even when you are not faithful to God, he is faithful to you. It is his faithfulness to us that is, that, that is what ultimately matters It is not so much of our faithfulness to Him that keeps us saved. It is His promise to us. It is His faithfulness to us that ultimately matters. And we can say this evening, Great is Thy faithfulness. Oh, I pray that this evening as you've been listening to this message, that you have been helped And that your help has not come necessarily from me as a pastor. Your help has come from the Word of God. And as you've seen the importance of turning to Him as He is our provider, He is our protector, and He is our preserver, what do we have to fear? Nothing. Let's pray together. Our Father... Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you so much for Psalm 121, how it ministers to us, your children, and reminds us of your divine attributes, your unchangeableness, your faithfulness to us. And Father, I pray, Lord, for all of those who are working behind the scenes and helping this, uh, this crisis, this global crisis. We pray for our national leaders. We pray, Lord, for wisdom. We pray for all of those who are serving us on the front lines, those doctors and nurses who really putting their own lives at risk in order to save those that they may not even know. I pray for their protection, Father. And Lord, we do pray for a miracle that in your power and in your might that you would stop this virus. It is not out of your control. And so we pray and we believe that you are able. 
to do just that. We pray that you bless Barrow Baptist Church, even in the midst that we're unable to meet together, may we still function, maybe even more than what we ever have before, may we function as a body, and may we help one another who is in need. May we trust you, and may our faith grow from day to day. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Again, may the Lord keep you in his care is our prayer.